that verse. Hallelujah. Lord, you're my portion, you're my salvation. Is that not awesome or what? You got so much to celebrate. I'm about ready to explode. Can you tell? Not yet? Okay. First John chapter three. Turn there if you would. First John chapter three. We're gonna be looking at the last several verses there. Quick shout out to some friends of mine in from out of town, Nam and Anna Ho. Good to see you guys. My, f- my favorite uh, new, uh, person from New Zealand, my favorite person from Vietnam. So thank you. The only people I know from those places. So no, just kidding. Uh, they're with Reconciled World. They're traveling the world. I think yesterday they were in the Congo. The day before that they were in du- uh, Dubai. The day before that they were in Singapore. I can't keep track of you guys, but uh, g- glad to have you here. It's always, it's always good to see you. So get to know them if you would between the services. Find out what God's been doing in and through them. And so 1 John chapter 3, we are, uh, we're going to be talking about condemnation, uh, not in a bad way, but in a good way, because God, I think this morning, wants to free us from a heart that is self-condemning, uh, a heart that is self-critical. Sometimes aren't we the hardest on ourselves? Would you agree with that? Like, so I'm reading this story the other day of uh, these firefighters in Portland, Maine, who get called out uh, to a, a fire at a house. It's a dryer fire. Uh, uh, a side note, clean your dryer uh, lint trap thing, all right, just so you guys know. Uh, they get called out to this dryer fire, and then they get a call that there's another fire at their fire station, Rushing to get out to tackle the dryer fire, someone left dinner cooking on the stove. They go back to the station to put out their own fire. And the captain is being interviewed, and here's what the captain says. Firefighters are human too. Is that awesome or what? Like we're sitting there going, no, right? Like of all the people that should know better, right? And yet I think about his words, firefighters are human too, and I sit there and I think about us as those who love Jesus. And how often, you know, we're, we're good maybe taking care of stuff outside of us, but when it comes to taking care of our own business, sometimes we just fall short. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we make mistakes. And I just want to say, Christians are human too, Right? You know, unlike the, the, the license plate frame I saw in that car months ago that said, Jesus is sick of your crap. Remember when I told you guys about that? Imagine pulling up behind a car where it says, Jesus is sick of your crap. Like, I'm already condemning of my own performance in my own life. Like, I need to hear that. Well, this morning is, is anti-Jesus is sick of your crap kind of message. Today is for those of us who earnestly and honestly want to love Jesus and walk with God and try to love others, but we do it imperfectly. You know, the the quote that's carried me for, for a couple decades now is the quote that says, God doesn't love you because of your competence. He loves you because of your desire. Right? Like, we, we, we were part of church, and, and how many people outside of church feel like, I don't belong there because you guys got it all together. There's people walking by here and they're going, I would not want to be a part of that because those people got it all together. How many of you this morning can say, I honestly don't have it all together? All right, yeah, the rest of you are liars. And so just in your lying, you proved you don't have it all together. It's a self-defeating argument. The fact is, we, even though we may not have our critics on the outside, aren't we master critics of our own hearts? Can I tell you, being in ministry and and serving the Lord, I I wish I just hit a home run every day. I wish my my batting was was a thousand. But you know what? I I strike out more than I get on base, spiritually. I I really, the bat flips out of my hand. I hit innocent bystanders in the... In the, in the, watching the game. I just, my performance is not what I want it to be, but I have to be reminded of myself that I, I'm a human being. And I'm going to make mistakes. You want a list of my mistakes? Talk to my wife. You want more? Ask my kids. You want more? Ask the elders of the church and the leaders of the church. But that doesn't do anything about my own heart that sometimes just 
just does this ransacks my emotions. Have you ever been there where, where Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is incurable. Like there's this battle that goes on within each and every one of us where you may not condemn me, you may not criticize me, but I do it masterfully to myself. I've told you guys, Sunday mornings, while it is the, the, the peak of, of my time with you and being able to dive into God's word and sing together, it's after Sundays the enemy comes in and attacks my heart and says, you, you said that, and that came out wrong. Or you didn't say that, and you should have said that. And there's this mental battle going on within me where I am so self-condemning, so critical. Even with you guys going, that was an awesome message. I'm inside going, no, it wasn't. And I go home, and I have to fight those voices. How about you? You, you ever fight those voices inside? Where, where you just think like, man, it is so good to taste the joy of the Lord, and yet there's that voice that says, but you know how you failed to love that other person, don't you? How you passed by that homeless person, you didn't give them anything, or how even in church the pastor brought up that the topic, and you know you've been negligent in that area, and all of a sudden there's this all this attack. And I want you to know Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Amen? How much condemnation is there for those in Christ Jesus? None. Wow, you guys are like borderline charismatic. That's awesome. <laughs> See, there, there in God's word is, there's, there's words of comfort for those with hurting hearts. There's words of of comfort for those with, with confused consciences. God wants to heal your heart and clear your conscience, but he can only do it by his spirit through his son. And that's what we're going to do this morning. 1 John chapter 3. Look at these verses. This is good because there, there's so much to say here, and I could probably spend do three messages out of this one message. But let's, let's just try to get some information, some glean some insight, some wisdom, pray more importantly that God's word becomes that living and active tool in our hearts to, to speak comfort to us. Because again, God is not loving you because of your competence. He's connected with you because of the desire that you have for him. And I love that. So 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 18. Little children, isn't that good? Like, sit down, little kids. Listen, this is, this is the elder John the Apostle, who's probably in his 70s, 80s, the, the, the resident grandfather, little children. Let us not love one another with word or with tongue. Why? Because the Bible says talk is cheap, but love one another in deed and in truth. Right? Real love acts. The Bible frequently talks about an act of love. We shall know by this that we are of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before him in whatever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And in this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. And the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given to us. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Three points I want us to look at. The first one is this. God gives us reassurance for the doubting heart. If you don't like the word doubting, put in confused, imperfect, struggling, whatever word you want to use. God meets us in a place where he's saying, I am greater than your heart. See, we're coming out of this section where John says, by this we know we're, we're of the truth that we love each other, right? And so while we may think we're loving God and loving each other, sometimes we can be very self-condemning and go, I didn't love that person as much as I should have. Or I love that person self selfishly or, or what have you. And it's easy to do good things for God and yet have a condemning spirit within you. And God wants to free you from that. See, 
He provides reassurance for those hearts that begin to, to waver and doubt. Because here's what you need to understand. Jeremiah 17, I just quoted it for you. What you can't miss is the following verse. Check this out. First, uh, Jeremiah 17. The heart is more deceitful than anything else. It is incurable. Who can understand it? The next verse. I, God, examine the mind and I test the heart to give each according to his way. See, what Jeremiah does is he says, while our hearts are fickle, while they're crazy, while they're wavering, God is the one who steps in and says, but I examine the mind and I will reward you accordingly. That's good to know. See, we need to hear these, these verses because your heart is not the final standard. Amen? Your heart is not the final authority. Your heart is not the Supreme Court. See, imagine a courtroom scene. Your heart is the accuser, you're the defendant, but God's the judge. And how often we just let that heart accuse and accuse and accuse. And when is it that God brings that gavel down and reminds you your heart it does not have the last say? Because God is greater than our hearts. Is that not awesome truth or what? See, we have to remember that while we think we, we know ourselves, who knows us better than we know ourselves? God. That's why the psalmist declares, search me and, and try me, O Lord. See if there be any anxious way in me. 139, Psalm 139, the psalmist lays his heart before the Lord and says, look at it. Look at it and see if there be anything that I need to be aware of. Because the ultimate basis of our relationship to God is not based upon our hearts. It's based upon the greatness of our God. And is not God greater than our hearts? So when our hearts accuse us, it is God's benevolent omnipotence and omniscience that provides spiritual CPR. We need rescuing and we need to be delivered and there's this thing in circles within evangelicalism that we rarely talk about, but it's spiritual depression. Write that down. We all get a little moody. Let's just admit it. We all get a little moody. And years ago, this guy named Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book called Spiritual Depression. It's cures, it's causes and it's cure. He wrote this in the 60s. But it was a topic people didn't want to talk about. Why? Because we've... We've generated a culture where, you know what? No, I got Jesus. Everything's okay. And we wear these fake smiles and we act like everything is good when inside we're, we're at war with ourselves. So Dr. Jones writes this book called Spiritual Depression. And I love how he opens the book by quoting the psalmist where the psalmist says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Don't you? Don't you love the Psalms? If you've never read the Psalms, it's like the, 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 it's David's journal. It's David's diary. And he's exposing his heart, his life before the world. And there's a section in the Psalms where he says, Why you downcast, O my soul? And then the next verse says this. Hope in God! Exclamation point. Like he's just, uh, Why you downcast, O my soul? Life sucks. God doesn't care. And people mope about Claim in the name of Jesus, but they're spiritually moody. And honestly, there's people here that like distance themselves from such people. Because they're like, boy, they're really down in the dumps, aren't they? But the reality of it is, people struggle. People go through moods. People experience different things. People respond to circumstances differently. But the, the, the objective for every single person in this room, no matter how spiritually moody you are or you're not, is this. Hope in God. Why you downcast, O your soul? Why? Hope in God. This is subjective. He is objective. And so, spiritual depression can only be conquered not by trying to do battle with your own heart, but leaning upon a God who's greater than your heart. Hope in God. Look at how this plays out in the ministry of Jesus. Two examples. Mary and Peter. Jesus goes to Martha and Mary's house. So Martha and Mary, Lazarus, brother, sisters, besties with Jesus. 
okay? He knows Martha makes a kicking casserole. So he's over at their house, and he's reclining in the, the lazy boy, and Mary's at the feet of Jesus listening to the master speak and teach. Meanwhile, Martha's in the kitchen making her famous dish, and Jesus speaks to the situation. Because he's saying to Martha, who's busy, your sister has chosen the better portion right now. See, while you're busy and we appreciate your busyness, your sister is at my feet listening and taking in what I have to say. And I wonder why Jesus addressed this maybe awkward moment. You know, family get-togethers can be a little awkward, right? There's someone doing all the work, and then there's someone not doing any work. And there's like this unspoken passive aggressiveness that's going on, right, in the environment. And so Jesus says, Martha, put down the tongs and come join us. Right? And I wonder if Jesus says it, because I wonder if Mary, even though she's at the feet of Jesus, is going... I should be in the kitchen helping my sister. I should be at least setting the table. I should be at least vacuuming the house, doing something, right? She may be warring within, and I think Jesus reaffirms her position right then and there and says, she's chosen the better thing. Don't you love how Jesus speaks to the situation? What about Peter? You want to talk about self-condemning? Peter, you're going to deny me three times. No, I'm not. You will deny me. No, I'm not. I'm good. I'm with you all the way to the cross, Jesus. And the moment the authorities come in and arrest Jesus, they all scatter. Peter hears the rooster crow three times. Can you imagine the sinking feeling he has in his spirit when he was so proud and so bold and confident? Like, nope, I'm going all the way with you, Jesus, and doesn't. How self-condemning and self-critical he becomes He hears the rooster crow, that sinking feeling takes place, like, I've done what he told me I would do. Jesus goes to the cross, is buried, and is risen again. And then the risen Savior says to the women who find the empty tomb, go find the disciples and Peter and tell them, I'm here. We're we're getting ready for some business now. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Isn't it interesting that they single out and Peter? Because Peter at that moment was probably the most self-condemning person in the the Middle East. And Jesus wanted Peter to know that he's greater than Peter's heart. And then Peter and Jesus have this conversation. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Lord. I love you. Then, then feed my sheep. Three times. Peter, do you love me? <laughs> yes, Lord, you know I love Then go feed my Three times, right? One for every denial. But it's the last one where Peter says, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And then Peter says this. Don't miss it. Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Boom. Peter's acknowledgement that Jesus, yes, he was betrayed. Yes, his friends left his presence at the moment he needed him most. Hears from his disciple, Peter, you know I know your betraying heart. You know I know your denying spirit. And yet Peter's there hearing once again the words of the Lord saying, then go do my work. You're forgiven. And did not Peter from that moment on just go set the world on fire for Jesus? You see, those are just a couple examples for us to to once again realize that God is greater than our hearts. God knows what's going on within. He knows the struggle. He knows the battle. And he says to you, if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation. Stop! The woman caught in the act of adultery. All those people trying to condemn her. They all leave and yet it's her and Jesus. And Jesus says, where are those who are going to condemn you? She says, they're not here. But inside she's going, but you're the Lord. 
And he says to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Do we not understand that with Christ, we are fallible? With Jesus, we make mistakes. With Jesus, we sin. With Jesus, we mess up. With Jesus, we're messy. And yet he chooses to stick with us. Isn't that awesome? When people in our lives, the moment we say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, they're quick to leave us. There's one who will never leave us or forsake us, and his name is God, and he is greater than our hearts. He knows our hearts, but yet he sticks with us. Don't forget this. That's why John writes these wonderful words. Read them again. We shall know by this that we are of the truth and shall assure our heart before before him. Verse 19, in the verse 20, whatever our heart condemn us, we need to realize God is greater than our hearts. One last passage from the Apostle Paul. So you guys know this is not something that's just found in a few places in Scripture. This is found throughout the Word. I'm reading a, a little devotional with my boys last night. And it's cool because we talk about three characters, Moses, David, and Paul. And I, I asked the boys, what do all three of those men have in common? Great men of faith, Moses, David, Paul, what do they have in common? And I said, they're all murderers. And the boys are like, but what's amazing is even with their murdering background, even with their sin, even with their imperfections, God still used each of them mightily. Right? And the boys were like, and we prayed, and they went to bed with the biggest smiles on their faces because even in their little minds, they were wrestling with the fact, like, we can be human, and we can mess up, and we need to know that God can still use us because we live in a culture that's not that gracious. And we live in churches that certainly are not gracious at times. And if God can use murderers like them, boy, think about what he can do with us. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3, 4, and 5. Paul, the ex-murderer, says these words. I love this passage. He says... It is of little importance to me that I should be evaluated by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even evaluate myself for I am not conscious of anything against myself because by this I'm not justified. Meaning Paul has become so self-aware of who he is, not because of people, not because of himself, but because of the Lord. He says, your evaluation, my evaluation doesn't matter anything when it comes to justification, who I am in Christ. This is what he says. The one who evaluates me is the Lord. There, don't judge anyone. Therefore, don't judge anyone prematurely before the Lord comes who will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the heart. And then the praise will come to each one from God. Is that awesome? Like, Paul just wants to silence his critics and say, Don't you even try to evaluate me. Don't judge me, because guess what? I'm not even going to judge myself. Because in Christ, I stand justified, and there's nothing anyone could do, even my crazy heart can do to change that position. That's good news. Amen? How do we get to that place? Here's the question. How do we get to that place where I go, okay, I'm going to overcome my, my crazy heart. I'm going to overcome the, the somersaults my heart does before the Lord and, and try to do something about the battle and the struggle. Well, this is what comes to point two. Boldness in the praying heart. More than anything else, God will bring you back to the position of relationship with Him. More than anything else you need right now in your life to do battle with a heart that is self-critical and self-condemning is the fact he's not asking you to do more performing, go jump through some spiritual hoops. He's asking you to stop and get connected with him. And the greatest connection you have with God is through praying. This is why I look in verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, 
we have confidence before God. We have boldness before Him. And whatever we ask, i.e. pray, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Three things I want to talk about. Number one, confessing. Number two, resting. And number three, obeying as a result of delighting. First, confessing. John's dealt with this topic in chapter 1. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, we find that God is more than willing, more than able. He's ready to forgive us our sins and restore us. See, what we wrestle with is if there's something my heart is doing, you know, it doesn't hurt to have examine our hearts before the Lord. And maybe there's something that God wants to point out regarding sin that dwells within, something that's there and we're doing battle with. And confession is us coming before the Lord and saying, you're pointing this out, I want you to help me deal with it. I want to come clean. I don't want this thing to be a hindrance between me and you. Because that's what sin does. Sin is an obstacle between our relationship with the Lord. And John says, be quick to confess those things because you don't want anything to hinder this relationship. And if we continue to walk in unconfessed sin, let me just tell you, the heart battle grows stronger. Because when you're, not dis- when you're not connected with God and there's something within you that you haven't come clean with, it continues to drive a wedge between you and the most important relationship in your life. And so what is confessing sin? It is acknowledging by God's truth, by God's word, what he deems to be right and correct. And if there's something in me that doesn't match up with his will, I get it right before him. I come clean and I confess. And there's something that happens with confession where all of a sudden this burden's lifted, right? The heart tends to be cleared. The the waters are not as muddy. They become clear. I can see through it. And so confession is key when it comes to being bold before God. Because the reality of it is you've been given access to the throne of God because of Jesus. And we dare not treat our relationship with God in a trivial way. Just because you're saved doesn't mean your life is on a trajectory, a trajectory of perfection. Amen? We make mistakes. And this is why we have to clean. It's called confession. And so as we walk with God, there's daily confession at times. Some of you have hourly confession. Some of you have minutes where you confess. You've been confessing like 100 times already today. God meets you in those places. But as we confess, here's what happens. We rest. And can I tell you the greatest gift that God gives to any soul that he adopts as his son or daughter is the fact that you are now able to rest because everything that the universe holds against you, the condemnation, the guilt, the sin, God says he's removed that. And more than anything else, God wants you to rest in his presence. John 15 abide in christ and when you abide with him he'll he'll abide with you so there's a resting that happens and you approach the throne of grace hebrews 4 with boldness and with confidence and you ask there's something about being in the presence of 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 children and when they find you to be comfortable when they find to find you to, to to be a person that they can be at ease with you know what there's conversation that freely flows and all of a sudden when someone is resting in god there's 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 communication He's like, can I, can I have this? My kids know, like, hey, dad's in a good mood, right? Like, I've, I've done well. I haven't done anything for him to go ballistic on me about whatever, you know. And all of a sudden, they'll just be bold and ask for something. Dad, can I have five, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups? Like, just because we're having a good relationship right now, you know, they, they just know they're smart. They can ask for anything. And they'll probably get more from mom than, than from dad. She's grace, I'm truth, and together we we form this co-parenting unit. But I just find it to be a a wonderful experience that when you're walking in a way that's pleasing, sometimes you can just be bold and ask for something crazy. And God's not afraid of that. 
God loves it when you approach him with small prayers, with big prayers. The key is that he wants you to be restful in that, in that relationship. And so look at verse 21, 22 again. And whatever we ask, we receive. Now, you would look at that and think that, boy, this is just a, a blank check with Jesus' signature on it. Can we really ask God for anything? And is there a guarantee that he's going to give us anything we want? It's like that often misquoted psalm that says, God will give you the desires of your heart. As if, well, I want this! And we just ask God for it. And what if he doesn't deliver? Then it's like, you're a jerk. God, I can't stand you. I asked for this and you didn't give it to me. This is not a carte blanche promise that God will give you anything you want. But I will tell you, God will give you everything you want when he alone is your soul, delight, and desire. See, what God wants you to experience first is Him. He wants you to realize that He's the greatest gift. That He's the only thing you would ever want. And when you rest in that, God says, ask. Ask whatever you want because when He sees your heart in alignment with Him, He sees you as His daughter, His son, and says, you love me first, why would I not want to give you this or that or this? We need to be reminded of these things. It's like the elder brother from the prodigal son account. Luke chapter 15. The the son that wandered and squandered and came back, right? He he found that place of confession and he found that place of, of resting, right? There's no place better than my dad's house. But I believe the main character of the account is the older brother who's in the back corner of the, of the backyard pouting. Whoa. He, he took the inheritance. He basically snubbed you and goes and lives life all high in the hog, literally and figuratively, and he comes back and you take him in? And here's the older brother like, have I not been the perfect child? Have I not obeyed you and jumped through all your hoops and been been that perfect model of what a son should be? I'm not celebrating his return. And Jesus clearly points out the issue. Because the father responds to the elder brother and says, it's not your performance, your perfection." your model son lifestyle. That's not what I've wanted. I've wanted a relationship. So you have two boys, two opposite ends of the spectrum, and the realization of it is this. The older brother thought that it was all about works and it was all about performing and it was all about doing the jobs and and the father missed the connection with the older son. What's a dad and a child relationship look like? It looks like resting. It looks like knowing that I'm, my kids are going to... I'm going to love my children whether they perform well or not. I'm going to love my children whether they do everything I want them to do or totally despise what I want them to do. But the love of a parent for a child goes beyond performance and goes back to relationship. And God says, rest in this. Which then brings us to the last point. Because when you're abiding or you're resting with, with God through Christ, you will be obedient to the Father. Right? Because this is, ask whatever you want from God because when we keep His commandments and we do the things that are pleasing in His sight, when you rest with God, there's a delight you have with God. I've got God, He's got me, we love each other, and there's this delight that now spills over into doing what God wants us to do. Why? Because there's nothing that would delight the heart of God more than a child who says, I want to do your will. And God values that. When you find your delight in Him, why would He not want to give you the delights of your heart? I've, I've, I've shared this before, and I, I can't just... I can't forget about it because as a young child, so probably 
fifth grade, sixth grade. This is a long time ago. My kids asked me the other day, Dad, how far back can you remember to your childhood? And I'm like, pretty far. Uh, Fifth grade. I'm at school, uh, Liberty Elementary up in North Phoenix. And uh, they used to do these things called Santa's Secret Workshops. Do you guys remember those? So before Amazon, before eBay, you had to go borrow money from your parents and go to the Santa secret shop and buy gifts for your family at school. And I'm going to tell you, it was a bunch of junk, all right? It was a bunch of junk. You know, there was, the, there was the generic world's greatest dad statue, right? And there was the generic little, you know, snow globe, mom, you're the best. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of selection. But as a kid, you didn't understand this. You left the house in the morning with a couple bucks that mom or dad had given you to go buy them a gift. And they knew that it wasn't going to be any sort of, you know, just amazing gift. Like, it was just going to be something that the Santa's secret shop provided. But I'm going to tell you that even though I took the money that wasn't mine, it was my, my dad or mom's money, and I went to this school and I had the freedom to select a gift for my, my parents, my choosing of something was very, very intentional. I wanted to get them something that reflected my, my heart for them, my love for them, my appreciation for them. And I'd go home and I'd wrap it up, and horrible wrap job. I still have a horrible job. I do a horrible job wrapping gifts. How about you? Yeah, but don't condemn yourselves because of that, all right? So... But I remember sitting there, fifth grade, right? Like Christmas morning. Dad's opening the gift. And there it is, the world's greatest dad statue. Right? Like if Will Ferrell was in the room, he'd be like, good job, you did it! Good job, right? Like, so there's dad with the world's greatest dad statue. And dad gets the biggest smile on his face. And his heart... You could just tell, it's, it's lighting up his eyes. His whole countenance, his whole demeanor is just like, <gasps> and he gives you a hug. Because you took his money to go buy something very trinkety to give to him, and the value in that moment is not in the gift. The value in the moment is the act that a child has done before his or her parent and saying, this represents how I feel about you. This, this is prayer. This is the heart of a child before a holy, great God that says, nothing I have belongs to me. It's all been given as a gift. And I just, I've gone to the store and I've got you this. And I hope you like it. And God says, whatever motivation was behind you delighting in me is something I'm going to applaud. I'm going to appreciate. And we sit there and go, world's greatest God, you better believe it. And he's got the biggest smile and says, thank you. You're my son. You're my daughter, gives you a hug. And it's the relationship that makes that moment so valuable. Amen? So don't come to God with all your bells and whistles, thinking he's impressed with lasers and llamas and smog machines and whatever else you got going on. Like, here's the show, right? Like, God's impressed with this. Come and love him. Because deep down in your heart, you want to find your delight in him, that he's your daddy. He's your father. And he knows you better than you know yourself and know that he's greater than your heart. So ask whatever you want. Ask whatever you want. Someone said it like this. I love this. When our delight is in the love of God, our desires will be the will of God. Can I say that again? When our delight is in the love of God, your desires will be in line with the will of God. Last point. So there's reassurance for our doubting hearts. There's boldness, confidence for our praying hearts. Prayer, oh. Don't miss out just connecting with your God. Call out to Him, cry out to Him, pray. Nothing, nothing is a, is a greater lifeline between you and God than prayer. No matter how imperfectly you may pray. Why? Because God knows your heart. Last point is this. There is the, do we have the outline for it? I got I got oh, there it is. Confidence from an abiding heart. Three 
very visible fruits that come from an abiding heart. Number one, believing. Number two, loving. Number three, obeying as a result of treasuring. Notice I've hit obeying twice, and we'll talk about that here in a, in a moment. Verses 23, 24, and this is his commandment that we believe. So John can't get away from what is foundational to everything I've been talking about, everything he's been talking about, and that is believing in Jesus. I could promise you the world, and if I don't talk about Jesus Christ and him crucified, I've given you nothing. You could go seek the world. If you miss out on believing in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you will uh, uh, get nothing. Believing in Christ, accepting Him as Lord and Savior, is the key to having this confidence in life. Knowing that He has taken your sins. And like Ryan said, how many sins did God forgive? All of them. This is what believing in Christ gets you you're free from condemnation you get eternal life because you deserve it no you deserve hell but god gives you heaven because of the son and if you believe you are now no, under, no longer under condemnation hallelujah but the believing does not exist just by itself it will evidence itself in number two loving loving god loving others the Bible doesn't teach a do-nothing kind of love. It is a very active love that is attached to a very explicit believing. Look at verse 23. And we, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son and love one another just as he commanded us. What's the command? Back to John 13, right? As I have loved you and laid down my life for you, you're now to love one another. And by this, the world will know you're my, di my disciples by your love for each other. So saying you love Jesus... And that erupting into love for people in your life, friends, enemies, family, whatever, it all goes together. You don't say you love God and hate people. And you don't hate people and say you love God. And you don't love people and not love God. There's a love that happens between you and your creator that spills out into now your love for all people. The first is the doctrinal test, belief. Love is the ethical piece, the moral piece. And then we come to this last point. And the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know that this is what happens, that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given to us. First mention of the Holy Spirit in the book of 1 John. Dude, look at, I just, like that, yeah, that's not going to work. This, this, is, this is good right here. Thank you. Obeying as a result of treasuring. So notice just a moment ago, I talked about obeying as a result of delighting. Notice what is so critical in verse 24. The, the one who keeps God's commandment. The one who literally treasures God's word in his or her heart. Psalm 19, your word is sweeter than the honey that drips from the honeycomb. Your word is that lamp that guides my feet in dark places. Your word is the very thing that delights me, that excites me, that sends me over the moon. God, your word is that treasure. And when we hide that treasure in our hearts, there is a result that says you will obey what God says. If there's no obeying, there's no treasuring. So the question is, what are you treasuring? What is it the thing that's, that's making you all giddy up inside? What's the thing that's making that heart go, wow? Because I'm going to tell you right now, this is a, 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 a fireplace. And the only fuel that God delights in is the fuel of his word that you keep shoveling in. 
to make sure those embers are hot and that fire is hot and there is this raging thing going on within you that is fueled by God's word, that will lead to obeying and that will ultimately lead to pleasing God. Here are the answers. It's the spirit that confirms, yeah, you're doing the right thing. The person that comes to me and says, Pastor, I, I, I'm conflicted because I want to love Jesus more. Am I, am I on the right path? I sit there and go, yes, because loving Jesus more is only that thing that the spirit can give you because I can't talk to someone who doesn't have Jesus that wants more of Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? The very fact that you want to love Jesus more is evidence of the Spirit's work in you. Fuel that fire. Take that furnace that God's given to you and heap more of God's Word into it because only God's Word will satisfy you in the end. This is what I mean by obeying as a result of treasure. Isn't it awesome to know that God has invited us to his, his, his presence? He says, come in. Sit down. Listen. Pay attention. There's so much that would prevent us. Right? Like, I, I'm not going there. I know what I've done. I know the kind of person I am. And yet, God says, no, come. Come as you are. And find there to be acceptance and find there to be an environment of love where he's not going to condemn you, but he will show you where areas of your life you need, to, you need to straighten up. Jesus isn't sick of your crap. Can, you, can we just say that to ourselves? Jesus isn't sick of my crap. He loves me. He has come to set me free from any sort of fear, self-condemnation, self-criticism. And when that truth is sowed in you, Jesus says, the truth will set you free. Can we commit to be men and women of the word? Can we commit to treasuring God's word in our hearts? Can we commit to, to not being idol makers that we become every single day? of making this our God and that our God, and we just say, we know we have one God, He is our Father, He's greater than my hearts, and the very thing that He wants me to use to know Him and know myself is His, is His Word. Can we commit ourselves to that singular purpose to be men and women of the world? Word, not the world. Self-condemning moment. What did I just say? You will know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. And the Spirit then is able to do a work in us that we never thought imaginable. More next week as John continues, but it's good to be with you guys. It's good to dive into God's Word together. Shed a few tears together. Always good. Get some free Kleenexes from people in, in the coffee house. So thanks, Brother Kerry. Let's stand. Let's pray. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, much more than fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. By them we are warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Father, our hearts tend to be all over the place, but Lord, may by your help and by the Spirit's work, may we, before you, gather our hearts in. And may we become people who delight in you and treasure your word. Guide our steps. Make sure we are in step with the Spirit, Lord. May you send off that internal alarm that tells us when we're not. 
and set us on the course that leads to life and liberty and freedom in Christ for your glory. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his peace and grace and mercy forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great day, all right?